people who claim that there is incredible wealth, if we talk about the Winsters, for instance, uh, behind them, and that they do have access to a lot of money and so forth. And so one question that kind of automatically pops up, because I know the conversation has been on the on the on the on the front lines of the newspapers here in Sweden as well about the monarchy here, is that you like, do we really need them? They don't have the on the surface, then at least the the, the influence or, or power, as you say. Uh, but yet again, uh, they are there for what do you think? Only for the sake of tradition, it ends up causing a lot of money for for people and and tax uh, tax money and so forth. Do you think it's 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 tradition and it's uh, um, it, is it enough, so to speak, to just have it have them in there for tr- the sake of tradition? What, what do you think, Lawrence? Well, I mean, in terms of wealth, yes, they 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 have a lot of wealth, but basically it's public money. You know, I mean, they have the great art collection here, the Windsors, but it's a publicly owned art collection, really, you know. Um, it, it, it's interesting to look at the figures as a whole, because generally, when when one hears how much they might cost in terms of money from taxes to, to be there running these lovely houses and, and doing the things that they do, that normally comes from <clears throat> a criticism of some sort or, mm. or a right of challenge. But what doesn't get reflected in those sort of discussions, and it'll be the same for you and everywhere else, is that it doesn't actually explain in those articles how much money they bring in. Mm. And in Britain, it is perfectly clear that in terms of global tourism, they are the House of Windsor and its palaces and its, its art collections and all that, so they are the biggest tourist attraction in this country. And in terms of what they bring in financially, it exceeds what they receive financially to run that business on. Mm-hmm. It very much is a business, of course. Sure. And um, so, you know, I, I'm I'm not a supporter or a believer of, of, of this nonsense that they cost a lot of money. Actually, the balance sheet, when it's drawn up, shows that they provide profit. Okay. Mm-hmm. And profit of, of quite some considerable value. They also, because of the fact that they are designated, various members of the family are designated dukes of this or duchesses of that and, and basically control counties within the, the country and whatever, um, put a lot of time and effort and money back into those areas that they are the nobility of. And and all sorts of things happen where money doesn't seemingly have to come from the government or, mm. or from tax taxes directly. You know, it comes from, you know, let's say the Duke of Cornwall estate or something like that. Mm. And, and so... There's a lot that happens within society and sort of on on the ground, so to speak, uh, where money comes back on, on, onto the ground, you know, building houses, all, all all this sort of thing. So it's a bit of a circle. You know, the money goes out one way and comes back another way. It goes out as money and come, comes back as services. And um, farming, agriculture, is a lot of support. Um, there are so many charities that, that they front, you know, and... and, and enormous amounts of money going to those. Uh, so it, my, my personal feeling is that, that, that I, I, I would like to... I, I, I love the idea of monarchies because I like the idea of there being a challenge or, or somebody to act on behalf of people uh, when governments don't. And governments seem to not work on behalf of people most of the time. It, it's one of the points that I've made in a lot of my books. If one reads any description in any dictionary of the word democracy. And it will tell us every single time that gov- democracy means um, government by the people, for the people. And I don't know when I've ever really seen government by the people, for the people. What one generally and seemingly always sees is government of the people. You know, we seem to get laws made around us whether we like it or not. Do, do, and do the you idea think... of monarchy, certainly in a constitutional situation, is that it gives the people a, a champion, a figurehead, Mm-hmm. That has the right to challenge on those occasions, which unfortunately our monarchy doesn't. But I'd, I'd, I, I mean, I'd love the idea of monarchy to go, go back pre 751 and for it to have the rights and privileges that it did there to, to literally champion people and, and not to be personally wealthy, but to gain um, the, their, their establishments by, by virtue of the fact that they don't get moved out of office because what? people think they're doing a good job. What? what? In a way, you're kind of talking about there is you're talking about the the real king in a way, the one who stands with their people and not behind them, yeah. and when they go into battle, right? The one yeah. who actually spearheads the uh, you know uh, the the leadership, if you will. That's I'm, right. Yeah. 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 Do, do you think that the monarchy, you know, if, let's say that they were come 
come in a position of power today then or, or in some other way would you do you think that they would do a better job then than than most governments do i i, I don't know that it's a question of, of doing a better job because i mean the idea of governmental structure has been around for a heck of a long time i mean you know uh parliament was set up in britain in the 1100s and and i mean the, the concept is, is i have no problem with the concept of of, of, of governments and I, i i believe that nobody would dispute the fact that, that an elected body should be better than a dynastic body that just gets you know a heritable right to a position you're right right But because yeah the problem is that that there is Inter, you know, we have good governments and we have bad governments yeah. all the time, and it and it seems that that the whenever bad things are happening, I mean, it's a bit like now, you know, with with governments leaping in to put billions of pounds and dollars of public money into supporting the banks who have fallen yeah. apart because you know they've done all the wrong things, and yeah. oh, well, that's okay, I, I suppose, but. How is it that, <laughs> that we end up paying all the time? Yeah, exactly. It goes wrong. Yeah. Now, now, what I feel is that, that if there were an empowered monarch to challenge that sort of situation on behalf of the people, uh, it wouldn't necessarily stop it happening, but it would certainly ensure that, that the support and, uh, uh, came about in a different way that was fair, more fair. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's that that I want to see. There's nothing on the other side of the scales. You know, the, the government will always win. It will always make laws whether we want them or not. You never or very rarely have referenda for anything that is contentious or, or, or in dispute. And, and now it's kind of got worse because with the European Union, I mean, we now discover that most of our lives are not even run by our own governments. That's they're, true. They're, that they're run by a European Commission made up of people that none of us elected. Yeah. And probably don't even know who they are for the most part. Sure. And yet they are, they are making all these rules and, and running everything. So, again, I, I see the need for something, someone, something to be there as an institution to weigh the other side of the scales and to bring things into a better balance so that we're not dictated to all the time and, and have to suffer every time when they decide what moves they're going to make. All right. Yeah. Uh, really interesting hearing from your perspective here, Lawrence. And, uh, Uh, we're kind of uh, approaching the end of our time together here in the first segment. And uh, uh, if we do, do you feel up for continuing uh, a conversation oh, yeah, with us? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a... Very good. And I want to leave the last few minutes to you, though, so you can mention a few of uh, your titles and, and your website. And I guess the best way to go to get copies of some of your books is that to your website? Oh, yes, certainly. The website's a, a very fast and easy way to, to, to go to get copies of the book. Uh, you know, it just links through to Amazon and click, and, click away and You have a copy of the book on, on your doorstep within a couple of days. Um, but, I mean, all, all of my books are available in, in good bookshops, good bookstores. Um, they're all in a variety of languages. Um, I, I think overall, if one counts the languages that are in, they're not all in the same languages, but they're into about 24 languages in all, each one. So, I mean... It, And there are seven books, so you know, seven books of an average of 20 languages a book. That's a lot of books. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's not difficult to get them at all. And um, in regards in to in terms of the titles, you, you you mentioned those. In fact, um, I really ought to alter my website because a, a couple of the things that, that I've still got on there, I've kind of retired from now. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, yeah, um, I I had a couple of years ago some some nasty surgery that that ended up sort of knocking me out of the public limelight for a while. I wasn't mm. able to give lectures and, and or to do television and, and things. And at the same time, I, I pulled away from 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 the the, the um, uh, active roles in some of the, the orders that I was um, involved with. But okay. mm -hmm. just as an example, you, you mentioned that it says on there I was attaché to the European Council of Princes. Yeah. I'm not actually now, but I mean, I'm, I'm still involved, but I, I don't do that now because I, I had to, to give it up but oh. essentially going back to what we were speaking to I, I mentioned all of these noble and royal houses that, that were exiled and deposed and, and aren't reigning now they still exist and, and, and they band together within this thing called the European Council of Princes so they've actually got like their own club um, where they, they meet and debate various things and, and, and various of them are advisors to the European Union But, okay, but that's uh, that's interesting though, because then we kind of end up back into the situation where we talked about how the European Union is taking over. But 
That's right. But you I'm know. saying they're advisors. I'm, what I'm not saying is that they're taken any notice of a lot of the time. I mean, <laughs> right, right. Okay. <laughs> um, but but the fact is that, um, and and so I I became involved with them really because of the fact that I I was a constitutional historian and um, you know I, I, my my learning process for a very long time has been about keeping up with national constitutions and the changes changes within them and mm. uh, and. and and so I, I began to be sort of used by, by the council and eventually became a part of it, you know, as, uh, as a non-prince. But um, So I, I became a sort of advisor to the advisors. Right, right. And it was very interesting. I, I did that for about 10 years. That was... There's a lot of bu- bureaucracy in there, or can you actually get things done? How, how does no, it work? there's no bureaucracy at all. It's, it, it was a, it's a very pleasant environment. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's not, not like they all meet every month or anything like that. That doesn't happen. I mean, it's mainly just a sort of um, connection through telephone calls and emails and things, and, and perhaps once every couple of years there might be um, a, a get-together, that sort of thing, in Strasbourg or some, somewhere like Frankfurt, maybe somewhere like that, and, um, and that's kind of fun. It's um, <laughs> usually a, you know a little bit ceremonial and, and, and quite nice. Right, right. Uh, but again, you know, it, it 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 has a ring to it. The European Council of Princes. I mean, it sounds, you know, I, I was going to say it sounds exciting. It it is exciting, but actually, it's it's just a bunch of of men and women doing a lot of good work charitably and and, and whatever else and. Um, Kind of retaining and maintaining the links with each other that that were there in reality as their families reigning situations um, a couple of hundred years ago maybe hmm. and, and 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 so it's very easy historically to forget them and to forget these families um, but it doesn't mean they don't exist just because they're not reigning anymore. Right, right. Yeah, that that's true. So uh, in regards to like the conversation we had uh, today, is there any specific book you'd like to recommend in regards to some of the history here that we've been talking about today? Golly, well, I think we've been, we've been in and out of uh, of a number of books, really. I mean, I suppose the book I always like to recommend is the current one. <laughs> yes, yes. It's always, it's always the latest book that is the easiest to get. Mention that for us, then. And that's called The Grail Enigma. Mm. Um, yeah, actually, I, I, it, it's a good book to get, because when I said before, the publishers don't actually like rewrites and updates of books. Um, it did, in my mind, become very necessary to write what I would consider a second edition and an update on Bloodline of the Holy Grail, which was my first book, which was 12 years ago. Mm. And essentially what I did was that instead of producing it as an update or a second edition of that book, I wrote it as an entirely new book with a different title. And within it is all the stuff I would have loved to have put into Bloodline of the Holy Grail, but didn't, or I've learned since it was published, uh, and it's it's now you know there to write about, and the nice thing about the Grail Enigma is that one doesn't have to have read Bloodline of the Holy Grail to read it, because anything that one needs to know necessarily from the first book, I put in there again anyway. Um, so it, it, it's, I think, good advice to say that to recommend any of my books, if one is particularly interested, it's best to start with the first one and run through the series from there. Yes. But actually, one could buy the last one and still feel that one was back at the beginning. Sounds good. So, um, there's my answer, really. Yeah, it's a good way to tie it together there. Yeah, exactly. So do head on over yeah. to uh, Lauren's website, graal.co.uk. That's G-R-A-A-L dot C-O dot U-K. And click on the new book from the front page and you also can read a little bit more about the Grail Enigma right there. Uh, so thank you very much for this uh, first segment, Lawrence. Uh, stay with us then and we'll continue talking in a little while in our member section. Okay, we'll do that. Thank you. Before we end our first part and continue with Lawrence, I want to mention the Stars and Stones Forum this coming Saturday and Sunday, the 15th and 16th of November. This is with uh, Dan Winter, Edmund Marriage, Daniel Tatman, Samir Osmanajic and others. I have a link on the front page where you can get all the information. We also have some other upcoming events in November listed on our front page. And we'll mention a few more of those as we get closer. But take a look there for more information and all the links. Thank you for listening to our first part with Lawrence Gardner. We'll 